What's going on, everyone? Everybody doing all right today? Yeah? Okay. Awesome. Well, we're so glad to have you guys with us. If you would, would you stand with me as we read God's Word together, if you're able to stand? <clears throat> so glad to have you all with us, uh, especially those are, uh, of you who are joining us for the first time, anyone new tuning in online right now. We've been in this series through the book of Colossians, and uh, we our way through Colossians chapter 3, and it looks like we're on track to be done by the end of the month with this whole series, but I encourage you to go back and listen to the, to the other messages throughout this whole series. Um, Colossians chapter 3, if you'll turn there with me, we're looking at verses 18 through 21 this morning. It says this, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord, and husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. Let's pray. Father, we come to you right now, and God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's true, that it's holy, it's sacred. It's everything we need for life and godliness. And Father, we pray that you would help us today to learn from your word. God, help me to rightly divide the word of truth, God. And I pray that we would lean in to what your spirit is saying through your word today, that God, it would equip us, it would encourage us, it would challenge us, that God, that you would do something in our lives today. And we thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. You guys could go ahead and be seated. So just to recap a little bit as we've walked through chapter three, and I, again, I encourage you guys to go back and and listen to the previous messages to understand the whole context of Colossians. But in chapter 3, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this letter, he's talking to the Colossian believers, and he's telling them, he starts off by telling them about their new identity in Christ, their union with Christ, that they've been raised with Christ, that they're, they're hidden with Christ. Um, and and, and we, we unpacked that a couple weeks ago. And then he goes on to talk about, because of our new identity in Christ, that new identity should inform how we should live now in light of the gospel and he says to put off the old self right and we talked about that all the different sinful aspects of our lives that we struggle with whether it's anger or rage he talks about sexual purity all these things he says to put those off and then he says to put on the new self and David did such a great job last week. I know some of you guys were out of town, but he talked about that idea of putting on the new self, living out your new identity in Christ. And one of the things that David said was that the way we live out our new self, it comes through daily submission to Jesus, submitting our lives every single day to Jesus. I, I like to call that living a Christ-centered life. When we are intentional about submitting our lives to Jesus, wanting to live for his glory, we are basically saying, Jesus, we want you to be at the center of our lives. We don't want our lives to be centered around, you know, our past, our trauma, our hurt. We don't want our lives to be centered around people or our vocation. We want our lives to be centered around you, and we want to live in light of that. And so this idea of living a Christ-centered life is really putting on that new identity and living in response to that. And today, we're looking at this text and it's talking about the family unit. And in it, in, in, so you can see the kind of the, the, the trajectory of, of what Paul is teaching here, right? He's talking about this new self and, and how, the, how we should start treating others, being com kind and compassionate. And, and now he gets real focused in on relationships within the family unit. That our new selves, our identity in Christ should dictate how we function as families. How our marriages should reflect God's glory. How our parenting should reflect God's glory. And if you are a Christian student in here, how your lives should reflect God's glory in response to your parents being involved in your lives. You know, the fact of the matter is, I think this is such a really relevant message because we live in a society today where everything is coming against the family unit, isn't it? Right? I mean, we've seen marriages falling apart. 
And man, my heart just goes out to anyone that's ever had to walk through divorce. And maybe, maybe that's kind of where you're at right now. You know, we, we've seen the stats. You know, we've seen, you know, parents who are struggling with rebellious kids who are running from the Lord. We've seen children who are, have, have trauma and hurt from parents who hurt them. And, and, and we see the dysfunction in our society. And I really believe that the attacks that we see on families are really just a tool of the enemy because he knows that if he could break down the family unit, then he could destroy a legacy of faith. He could keep us from passing on the Christian faith to the next generation. And so today as we're approaching this text, I want us to just really lean in and kind of the big idea that I want us to see here is that Christ-centered families, you may want to write this down, Christ-centered families seek to display Christ-likeness in the roles that God has given them within the family unit. I'm gonna say that one more time. Christ-centered families seek to display Christ-likeness in the roles that God has given them within the family unit, ultimately for the glory of God. So with that said, we're going to look at the first two here in just a moment. And, and really, Paul is addressing the wives and husbands within a family unit. They're directed towards them. And what we know from Scripture is that marriage is ultimately God's design. We said this before, we'll continue to say it again. I know it's not popular to say this in our culture, but we know what God's word says to be true about marriage, and marriage was designed by God. It was instituted by God. As a matter of fact, it's the very first institution ever created in human history. That marriage was designed by God, and it's meant to be a man and a woman who come together in union. That is what a biblical marriage is. We know as we look back in Genesis chapter 2, he sees that after he created Adam in his image, he realizes that it's not good for Adam to be alone, and so he created Eve to be his helper. And aren't you thankful, men, that God said it's not good for man to be alone? Amen. Oh, man, guys, I just set you up. I set you up for a tee. Like, I teed it up for you today. I set you up for a home run. You were supposed to say amen. Amen. You were supposed to jump up and down. You were supposed to put your arm around your wife and say, that's right, pastor. So let's try this again, okay? I'm I'm setting you up. Maybe, I know it's early. You're still waking up. Maybe you have coffee in your system. But let's try this again. Men, God said it is not good for man to be alone. Okay, maybe maybe 11 o'clock will do better. That That was a little bit better. Okay, but anyways. But he said it's not good for man to be alone. And so he created Eve to be his helpmate. And really that word is, it means that she's suitable for him. She fits him. She complements him. And we need women in our lives. We need godly women in our lives. And, 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 and so God instituted marriage. And ultimately what we see throughout scripture is that marriage is is a display of the gospel. Paul uses marriage as a metaphor. He talks about Christ um, being like a groom who laid down his life for his bride, which is the church. And so Paul connects that in Ephesians 5 with Genesis chapter 2 with this idea that it's a display of the gospel. And I think this is one of the reasons why we see so many attacks on marriages because of what, it, what it's meant to display. And ultimately what we see throughout Scripture is that within the roles of marriage between a husband and a wife is that they're meant to complement each other. They're both equal, and they're, they, they're both meant to complement each other. And the thing about marriage is that even though that they're equal, they, what we see in Scripture over and over is this idea is that there's, there's roles that God has given within the marriage. You know, I was, I was thinking about this, and I, I'm, I was an athlete growing up, and so I'm always thinking of, like, athletic metaphors. And, uh, and, and I was thinking about, like, when I used to play basketball. Basketball's kind of changed now, but when I played basketball, you had clearly defined roles on a team, right? The starting five, like, you know, we were out there. We each had a clearly defined role, but we were all equal, right? 
Like, I played point guard. The point guard was responsible for calling the plays, getting their teammates involved, making decisions, right? Then you had, like, a shooting guard, and their role primarily, they were the scorer on the team. Like, they could shoot really good. Then you would have, like, your, your big men, like your center, and they were usually down low, posting up, you know, grabbing rebounds and all this stuff. And, and when we functioned in our roles, again, we were all equal to each other. We were on the same team. We were all fighting for the same thing, but we all had our own roles to play. And not one role was better than the other. And sometimes problems happen whenever someone got out of their assignment. Like, I'll never forget, there was one time I was playing basketball, and this huge, like, six he gets the rebound, and instead of outletting it to the point guard myself, who knows how to dribble, he starts dribbling the basketball all the way down, and he is slow as molasses. And I'm like, pass me the ball, pass me the ball. And of course, what happens? The ball gets stolen, Right? He wasn't functioning in the role that, God, that he was supposed to be playing in. And so what we see in marriage is this idea that we are equal, but we complement each other. And so I'm going to spend, and we're going to spend some time here, because uh, specifically on marriage, before we get into the other things, because I think there needs to be some unpacking. And I really want you to hear my heart as a pastor. Um, if I'm honest, I was even, I, I even like filtered this stuff through my wife. <laughs> talking. I was like, I preached this sermon to my wife. So she's heard it probably about three times already because I wanted to make sure that I was clear and also com- kind in wh- and, and, and just because I know how the enemy like twists certain verses around. And so what we see here in this very, in verse 18 is this idea and the very first thing, and we're going to talk to the wives first, is that Christ-centered wives voluntarily display Christ-like submission. I'm going to say that again. Christ-centered wives choose to voluntarily display Christ-like submission. Verse 18, he says, Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Now listen, that word submission, I already know, that's a trigger. Especially in our culture. We don't like to submit to anyone. As Americans, we're just like, we're, you know, man, we were founded on rebellion. (laughs) Right, and so it's just part of our culture, and we've also seen that word twisted. So please, listen, ladies, please don't tune me out, and I understand this. Again, let's talk about what submission is not, first off. Submission does not mean a wife is inferior to her husband. You need to understand that. Number two, submission is not agreeing on everything. You are not a doormat. Submission, number three, does not justify abusive relationships. Hear me. Does not justify abusive relationships. I can't tell you the manipulation and the abuse, and it, honestly, it's demonic, uh, that, the, the things that I've heard from people that have taken this verse and caused harm and pain and shame to women. Submission does not justify abusive relationships. And I'll just say this as, as one of the elders here. Please, if you or anyone you know are in an abusive relationship, please, please come talk to us. Please let us know. Because we do care, and we take that seriously. Submission does not mean that women are not strong, valuable, or incapable. You need to understand that. But again... Hold off. I want you to listen. Submission does not mean that women are not strong, valuable, or incapable. And that's really important because, again, we hear that word and, our, and it's twisted in our minds. And I get it. I understand. I, 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 it's a sensitive word. But the Bible doesn't refer to it like that. Matter of fact, you look at women in the Bible, and, man, the Bible elevates women. Jesus elevated women. Christianity, historically, done in the right way, has elevated women. The Proverbs 31 woman was not some little doormat. She was not incapable. Matter of fact, if you read it, like she was a thriving real estate agent who owned her own business. <laughs> and she was very much capable. She was multitasking, man. She had the finances in order. I mean, people love being around her. And yet she was a strong, confident woman who loved her family well. So submission does not mean that women are not strong, valuable, or incapable. Number five, 
using submission does not mean that men can use this verse as a tool to wield over your wives. Again, I've heard, I've heard people use this to say, oh, you just need to submit. Uh, I love what Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said about this. He says, he, he talks to men, he says, men, that means you shouldn't quote this verse to your wife. It's hers to obey, not yours to demand. So that is what submission is not. So what does submission mean? What does this word mean, submit, when we look at it in a biblical sense? And then why? Or then we're going to look at why Paul says this. But submit, literally, is, is this idea. It's a voluntary offering of oneself to another in willing support. I'm going to say that again. It's a choice. It's a voluntary offering of oneself to another in willing support. Submission is something that the wife voluntarily chooses rather than having her husband try to impose authority on her, right? And, and, and if you notice this, notice Paul doesn't say, wives, obey your husbands, like he tells children to obey their parents. Because obedience is something that is required, but again, submission is a voluntary choice. Are you guys following me? So Paul's not demeaning women saying, you must obey. No, 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 no. No, it's a voluntary choice. Now, I say Christ-like submission, or Christ-like submission because like with everything we're talking about today, Christ is our example. And we're called to reflect Christ in our lives. Amen, right? And so I say Christ-like submission because do you realize that Christ showed us the way of submission? He showed us the way of submission. And, and we see this idea that we're supposed to follow his example. I mean, scripture talks about that we're supposed to submit to one another as, uh, you know, as, as Christians and everything like that. But then we see it in this context with the marriage. But ultimately, we see that Christ displayed ultimate submission. Listen to this. In Philippians chapter 2, okay, we know that Jesus was in heaven. He, he is God, right? It says this in Philippians chapter 2, that he, Jesus, did not consider his equality with God He's equal with the Father. He's equal with the Holy Spirit. There, that's, where, that's where we get the idea of the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are equal, but they all have their own roles to play. And Jesus, who is God, was God, did not consider his equality with God when he came here on earth, but it says this, uh, as something to be exploited, but he emptied himself by becoming the form of a servant meaning Jesus humbled himself in his humanity. And that we see over and over in the Gospels that he was just like, I didn't come to do my will, but the Father's will. So we see that Jesus himself displayed submission in his life. Submission doesn't mean inferiority when we understand this then. Because Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit are all equal. Jesus is not inferior to the Father, is he? Right? No, he's equal to the Father, but yet he willingly submitted. And so when, when we, we, that's a really basic understanding of this. And so now that begs the question, well, why is Paul saying that within the marriage? Why, why is he saying this idea of submission? And listen, this isn't the only place that he talks about it. We see it, or, or, uh, and he's not the only author that mentions it. We see it at least three other times about this idea. Okay, so listen. There's a verse that I want to point to in 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Paul says this, but, and again, understanding, understanding roles within a marriage. We are equal, equal in value, in partnership, but, but what we see biblically is that there's complementary roles. And listen to this in 1 Corinthians 11. Paul says, I want you to know that Christ is the head of every man, and the man is the head of the woman, and God is the head of Christ. So listen to this, okay? Please don't tune me out. Listen. There's this idea of Scripture referring to the husband being the head. And, and all that is, is that God has given within a marriage, he's given the responsibility of burden, spiritual leadership. He's given that to the man to use that to serve his family well for God's glory. That's all that means that God has designed within the marriage for, for the men to be responsible, to be 
to, to, to serve in the spiritual leadership. That doesn't mean that women are not spiritual leaders. doesn't mean you don't have responsibility. does not mean that at all. But we do see this idea over and over where God has given this responsibility a burden. And here's the thing. With great responsibility comes great accountability. Because, men, we will be accountable for how we served our families or led our families or lack thereof. Tony Evans says spiritual headship or leadership is God telling the woman to duck so he can punch the man. <laughs> just let that sink in just for a second. Spiritual headship is God telling the woman to duck so he can punch the man. And listen, just like a head cannot function without a neck, listen, this is why we, we complement each other. We need women, godly women in our lives and vice versa. And wives need godly men in their lives to complement one another. And so what we see here in this verse, right, he says that Christ is ahead of every man, and the man is ahead of the woman. And listen to what he says here. And God is the head of Christ. What's Paul doing here? He's, you, uh, again, pointing to Christ, his He's saying God was the head of Christ when he was here on earth, like Christ submitted to him. And so he's using that as an example. And so what we need to understand, ladies, and I say this with all kindness and love and humility, a Christ-centered wife, wife looks at her Savior as an example of voluntary submission. Now, listen, I, I love this uh, illustration. Um, I heard a story about from... Uh, about Kathy Keller. Her husband was the late Tim Keller who pastored Redeemer Church in New York City. And in this, um, the, the, in this story, uh, essentially, they were praying about whether, whether or not they should go plant a church, whether or not Tim should go plant a church in New York City. And so they were going back and forth. Tim felt like they should go. He felt like God called them. Kathy did not want to go. And so Tim, and so they had a lot of discussions. Again, because they're equal. They, their voice, each other's voice matters. One day, though, again, Kathy didn't want to go, and Tim conceded to her and said, okay, if you don't want to go, we won't go, right? And Kathy replied, oh, no, you don't. You're not putting this on me. You have to make the decision and bear the responsibility. And in this article, she mentions that submission means that in matters of disagreement, I yield to Tim the deciding vote. I get a vote, he gets a vote, but I choose to allow him to get the deciding vote. And that's a great just little example of how that can play out in marriages. I mean, that's something that Manny and I, we've wrestled with, talking through things and, you know, and figuring out stuff. And, 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 and she goes on to say, Kathy Keller says, I discovered, listen to this, I discovered here that my submission in marriage was a gift I offered, not a duty coerced from me. I'm going to say that one more time. I discovered that my submission in marriage was a gift that I offered, not a duty coerced from me. See, a wife who voluntarily chooses to take an attitude of submission towards her husband is a wife who has a heart of being supportive for her husband. And choosing to support your husband, you're empowering him to have the self-respect he needs. And this was an article that I got from J.D. Greer, and I was like, man, that's so good. And that's so true, because let's be honest, men, sometimes, you know, I know we try to act all like we're just confident, and we've just got it all together and everything like that. But honestly, many times, we feel insecure about decisions, don't we? And, and there's something, and I know there's been times in my life where like Mandy and I are talking about things, and can I tell you, and I, whenever she's been like, okay, I trust you. Do you know what that's done for me in my own insecurity? It's given me confidence. It's also made me feel the weight of that, <laughs> that responsibility as well, because it makes me lean into God more, because I'm like, man, I don't want to mess this up. But it's empowering. It's empowering. Now listen, some may say, well, my husband's not a spiritual leader. And that means maybe I, well, I don't have to follow him. Well, this verse doesn't say submit when he's sufficiently a spiritual leader in your eyes. It doesn't say that. 
But I do think, and I, I just can't but help wonder, and everybody's situation is different. I know there's nuances, but I just can't but help wonder what if they felt some type of support? What if, how that would feel? Now listen, Paul goes on to say, submit, submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. And that's the key word there, key phrase, because the Bible doesn't command compliance under all circumstances. Meaning, ladies, wives, you do not have to submit to your husband if it's going to cause you to sin. If it's something that causes you to be uncomfortable. Again, if it's, to if it's something that's toxic, if it's something that's a matter of conscience, that goes against your conscience, it's like, no. It specifically says, as is fitting to the Lord, meaning it should be those things that are glorifying to the Lord. Because your first and foremost priority is to Jesus, not to your husband. Amen? You guys with me? I hope you guys hear my heart on that. Now listen, men, spiritual leadership doesn't just give you the right to do what you want to do. We've been charged with a great responsibility to serve our families well. To lead our children, to lead our marriages and here's the thing what Jesus said about leadership. Leadership is servanthood. It's not domination. It's not domineering. It's not manipulative. It's not controlling. It's not self-seeking. And so let's talk about that. If Christ-centered wives voluntarily display Christ-like submission, then listen, the second thing that we see in Scripture is Christ-centered husbands eagerly display Christ-like love. Or should display Christ-like love. He says, husbands, love your wives and don't be bitter towards them. Now, what's interesting about this word love is that there's different Greek words for love in the New Testament. There's, there's uh, phileo love, which is brotherly love, which is where the city of Philadelphia gets his name. There's eros love or eros, and, and that's intimate love, right? But then there's this third word that's used here, which is agape love. And this is the highest form of love. It's unconditional, sacrificial love. So Paul is saying, husbands, love your wives with an unconditional, sacrificial love. This is the type of love that God displayed for us through the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, Paul echoes this in the and he ties it in with the gospel. He says, husbands, love your wives, agape your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. This is an unconditional, sacrificial, servant-hearted type of love. This is not a selfish love. And what this means, friends, listen, and, and I want to just talk to all the men. And I'm not here to beat you over the head, but I do want to encourage you and challenge you that we are called to love sacrificially. Skewed manhood. Like on one side of the spectrum, you have men that are just super passive, sitting on the sidelines, not engaged with their family. On the other side of the spectrum, you have people like Andrew Tate saying, you don't have to get married. You just, you know, this is what manhood looks like. All these things, right? And they've skewed manhood. And listen, friends, it is that neither one of those are true. Because Jesus didn't just sit on the sidelines. Jesus displayed a passionate type of love for his bride. Aren't you thankful that Jesus was passionate enough for you that he laid down his life? And friends, men, this is the type of love we should have for our spouses. A passionate love. A protective love. Because Christ gave his life for her to protect his flock. And we're called to be protectors. We're called to be nurturers called to be providers we're called to display this sacrificial gentle love that's kind and and giving and honoring and here's what happens it's almost like it's almost like paul is saying these things and he echoes this again in other places that when we as men love our wives like this our wives will want to follow our servant leadership 
Do you see how that works? This is how God designed it. When we are leading and serving like we're supposed to and stepping up and taking responsibility, then our wives will want to follow. And why? Because it's building trust. They know that our intentions are good for them. See, Satan just wants husbands to be passive and to sit on the sidelines. And men, we cannot be like that. Why? Because your responsibility is to be active, is to take responsibility. It's what God calls us to. I'm not here to beat anyone over the head, but that is the reality. God calls us as men to lovingly serve and lead and take responsibility. If this is why the church has not done a great job with reaching men. It's like, but, but on the flip side of that, most men are just sitting on the sidelines. They don't want to be engaged spiritually. And what's so crazy is that 13 million more adult women than men uh, attend church every Sunday. It's crazy. In homes, check this out. Listen to this statistic. In homes where both parents attended church regularly, 33% of their children ended up as regular churchgoers. Listen to this. When the father doesn't go to church while the mother attends regularly, only 2% of their children will attend regularly. There's something about that dynamic when the man is taking responsibility over his faith and wanting to lead his family well, spiritually, how that impacts generations. Again, that's no, women, you play a huge vital role. I think about our single moms who are bringing their kids to church, and so I'm not negating that, but there is something about that. And Satan knows that if he could keep men on the sidelines, twiddling their fingers and looking at porn and, not, and playing video games 24-7 and not engage with their families. If he, he knows if he could keep them distracted, then he could rob the family unit. And man, listen, by God's grace, he wants you to step up and be the leader he's called you to be. He goes on to say, love your wives and don't be bitter towards them. The word bitter here describes something that's pointed or sharp that penetrates the senses. It's, it's like smelling a pungent cheese. It's a couple of years, I was thinking about this a couple years ago. Me and my daughter, we were, we were in a grocery store and they were giving out free samples. We love free samples. Who doesn't like free samples? And so like we went up and they had like this little cheese bar. And so man, we grabbed a piece of cheese and we're so excited because I love cheese, right? And I stick that in and both of us immediately, the pungent smell, odor, disgusting taste permeated, not only our mouth, literally permeated our, our whole nasal cavity. It was disgusting. I mean, I could gag just thinking about it. And it was so disgusting. It was pungent. It was disgusting. And Paul is saying, saying, men, don't treat your wife in such a way that is pungent to them. Don't be off-putting. Don't be sour in your marriage. How do we do, how do, we do that? Well, we, we don't be harsh to our wives. We don't belittle them. We don't ignore them. We don't shut them off or shut them out. We're not resentful. We're not domineering. We're not cutting. We're not tearing down. We're forgiving, we're kind, we're compassionate. We seek forgiveness when we blow it. Don't be pungent. Matter of fact, listen to this. 1 Peter 3, 7 actually talks about our prayers. Listen, men, again, the responsibility. 1 Peter 3, 7 says that, men, if you treat your, har your wives harshly, your prayers will be hindered. Christ-centered husbands eagerly display Christ-like love. Here's the third thing that we see. Let's talk to all the children, students, teenagers, even young adults, if you're still connected to your family, you haven't grown, right? It's this idea that we see that you're not excluded either, that your identity should inform how you treat your parents. Christ-centered children readily display Christ-like obedience. Christ-like children readily display Christ-like obedience, all right? Young person, hey, if your teenagers are sleeping, wake them up right now, okay? <laughs> all right, this is, parents, I'm trying to help you out, okay? Listen, Paul says this, children, uh, er, teenagers, look, look right here. Look up here, everybody, look, all right, cool. Listen to me. Children, obey your parents in everything. Now, obviously, everything is not meaning sinful activity, right? Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Listen, obedience to parents is required. This is not voluntary submission. 
Again, that's why there's a difference with wives. They, they voluntarily choose. Children, you are required to obey your parents. Again, not in matters of sin. The opposite of obedience, listen, the opposite of obedience is rebellion. And scripture says that rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. Because it's the sin, it's what Satan did to God. He rebelled against God's authority. And what you need to understand, students, young people, your parents were put in place of your lives, were put in charge of your lives, and are responsible to God. He placed them as authority figures in your life, whether you like it or not. Proverbs talks about a wise child listens to their parents. A fool disregards their advice. And so listen, students, you have a choice. I mean, you still have a choice. You could either choose to be wise or foolish. But God has placed your parents, and again, they're not perfect. None of us are perfect. Any perfect parents in here? Nope, nope, no one's raising their hand because we're not perfect. We need the grace of God. We blow it. However, you aren't responsible for them, but you are responsible for your attitude and actions towards them. And just like Christ's example to wives and to husbands, guess what? You're not excluded to. Because Jesus set the ultimate example of obedience to his own parents, his earthly parents. In Luke chapter 2, we don't have time to read it, but Jesus, when he was around 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem, him and his family, and somehow Jesus got separated from his parents, and he went into the synagogue, and he starts teaching. And they're blown away. The religious leaders are like, holy cow, look at this 12 years old. He's teaching us, like, with the authority of God. His parents are freaking out because you know how moms are. They lose sight of their kids. Could you imagine moms, Mary, in that moment, just freaking out? Like, where's my kid? You know? And because motherhood kicked in. Even though she knew he was God's son, it's like, no, that's still my boy, right? So she's, like, panicking, finally tracks Jesus down. And she's probably like, where were you at? And Jesus is like, well, I'm, I, was, I was just doing my father's will. And he had every right to, on one hand, because he's kind of God's son, but then, listen, in his humanity, he, listen to this, it says this in Luke chapter 2, it says, then he, Jesus, went down with them and came to Nazareth. Jesus, God's son, obeyed his earthly parents. Why? Because scripture calls children to obey their parents. Paul says that this pleases the Lord. The students, listen. I'm going to say something to challenge you. You don't have to raise your hand, but do you love Jesus? Just say, answer yourself. Yeah. You know, you don't have to raise your hand. It's, but if you love Jesus, right? Then don't you want to please Jesus? And what good is it if you come to church and you can raise your hands, but you don't obey their instructions when you get home? And Paul's saying, this pleases the Lord. Like, this is what is going to help you for the rest of your life. Ephesians, he echoes this. He says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, because this is right. And then he says, honor, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment, with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may have a long life in the land. Man, how many students want to, you want to live a long life, prosperous life? Honor your parents. Again, not in matters of sinful issues. And again, I know that there's been abusive relationships, and so we're not speaking to that. We're not saying, children, if you're in an abusive relationship, that you have to honor your parents, you have to do everything you say. If you're in an abusive relationship, child or teenager, whoever you are, student, please come talk to us. Please let a youth leader know. Please. But the goal, if you're in a, if you're a family, if you have good parents who aren't perfect, your responsibility, if you love Jesus, because of your new identity in Christ, is to now obey your parents. Here's the last one. Because parents were, were not excluded. And this was tough as well. But Christ-centered parents willingly display Christ-like patience. I'm going to say that again. Christ-centered parents willingly display Christ-like patience. Verse 21, Paul says this, Fathers, don't exasperate your children so that they won't become discouraged. Now listen, I know it says fathers particularly, but actually that word can be translated to parents as it's, as it's translated in Hebrews 11.23. And so, for whatever reason, Paul was... Anyways, so we could, we could apply this for, as parents, 
that we are, mom, dad, we are called to display Christ-like patience with our children. And that is not always easy, is it? (laughs) But we're called to that. And again, all this flows from our union with Christ, our identity with Christ. That word exasperate means to provoke, to become disheartened, to dishearten them, to provoke them. And, and, you know, I think about this and, you know, we can, we can exasperate our children through our own anger. We can exasperate our children by tearing them down and cutting them, by making them feel like they're not good enough. By, we, we can exasperate our children. Sometimes Christian parents, listen, sometimes we can be a little too legalistic and exasperate our children. But we're not presenting a, perp- a, a, a clear picture of the gospel of grace. We can exasperate, and Paul is saying, hey, we must display this Christ-like patience. He says, don't exasperate them so they won't be discouraged, meaning it's this idea that, that you know, we can dis- dishearten them. And, and here's what happens. Discouraged children will then seek encouragement from the things of this world, from their friends, from relationships, from sex, from whatever it is. They'll try to find encouragement. And parents, we're called to be the greatest influencers in our children's lives. And listen, I I don't say this in condemnation, but this is our responsibility. And by God's grace, we can do that. Our goal should be to reflect the patience of our Savior that he's had on us. I have this verse in Psalms 103. It says, the Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in faithful love. He will not always accuse us or be angry forever, and he has not dealt with us as our sins deserve or paid us according to our iniquities. Man, think about that. And then the psalmist goes on to say, as a father has compassion on us, or he says, he talks about the, as a father, like a father, he's had compassion on his children. And, and that's what we're called to display, that kind of Christ-like patience and, that we don't, and listen, man, I, I've fallen short. There's been so many times. My children can testify to this. There have been so many times where I didn't get this right, where I've had to go and apologize to them. Now, that's always humbling. But this is what we're called to. We're called to follow Christ's example. Why? Because he's our standard. He's our measure. He's our standard in our marriage relationships. He's our standard in our parental relationships. Children, he's your standard in how you follow your parents. Again, I know this is a challenging, challenging talk for so many of us today. But here's what I want you to know. Today's a new day. Maybe you've fallen short in this area. Maybe you haven't always displayed Christ-like submission. Maybe you haven't always displayed Christ-like love. Maybe you haven't always displayed Christ-like patience with your kids or, or children. Maybe you haven't always displayed Christ-like obedience. Here's the good news. is that with God, there's always grace and forgiveness. Amen? And today, we can choose to not only make things right with God, but also even maybe make things right with each other in our family unit. And imagine what would happen if, like, if everybody in the family is taking ownership of their own faith, saying, I just want to glorify Jesus. Imagine what would happen if, if the husband is, is keeping Christ at their center, if the wife is keeping, keeping Christ at their center, if the kids are keeping Christ at their center. Guess what happens? And if you could picture this in your mind, if you've got the husband and wife and the child over here, then what's going to happen? Christ is literally going to be standing in the center of them, and he's going to be the one that holds them together. And that's what God calls us to. And this is the key for families to thrive and to function for the glory of God. Let's pray. Our worship team's getting ready to join us. Just as every head bowed and eye closed, and we're getting ready to have a time of response. So we're just thinking about today's message and getting ready to respond. I want us to think about this message and ask ourselves, is there any area that I haven't displayed Christ-likeness to?
if you're married, think about your relationship with your spouse. And is there, do you need to get something right today? If you're a student, is there any area that you haven't displayed Christ-likeness? Think about those things. My prayer is that you just respond to that today. For all my non-Christian friends that are maybe here this morning, I know you came on an interesting Sunday. It's probably not what you thought you were going to hear in church, but man, we're so glad that you're here, but I want you to know something. God brought you here for a reason. And he wants, he offered his son, Jesus, and displayed that sacrificial love on the cross. And the fact is, we're all sinners. We've all fallen short, and we are all guilty of our sin and stand condemned and deserve hell. But the good news is that Jesus sent his son on the cross to die, to take the place for your sins. And scripture says, if you today, if you will heed his warning, if you will call upon the Lord and believe, scripture says you will be saved. And so even in this moment, friends, I want to encourage you right now to say, Jesus, save me. Because he died for you. He gave his life for you. We're going to have a time of communion. And I'm going to encourage the families today. Maybe your spouse isn't here, but if you're able to, I'm going to encourage the families to take communion together. And I just think that would be special uh, as we celebrate that, as we're thinking about the grace that God has given us. We're thinking that even in this moment, maybe you've asked God to forgive you, like thinking about how he's forgiving you because of the cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much today for your word. We thank you, God, because your word is true and sometimes it's challenging, it's convicting, it's hard, it's not easy, but God, by your spirit, you call us to this and by your grace, we can live accordingly because why? We are united with Christ. He's our identity, and I pray, Father God, that as a church, that we would respond to that in a real way. God, we love you so much today. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you guys stand up with me right now? Our worship team is going to lead us in this last song. We want to invite you just now to come forward and just respond to whatever God's doing in your life today.